Hey folks, I'm Chris Thornton, this is Not School, and one of the things which I'd like to do with this new channel is tell you about some of the really interesting things in science and culture and history which there isn't really room for in the school syllabus. I'm going to start out with one of my favourites. This is the story of a 6.2 kilogram lump of plutonium and gallium alloy which became known as the Demon Core. <music> In the summer of 1945, the United States became the first, and thankfully still last, country to ever drop a nuclear weapon on another country. These were the detonations over the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan. They were anticipating the need to drop a third nuclear weapon over another city, but actually Japan surrendered before they were able to do this, and so that nuclear core remained at the Los Alamos laboratories. Now this core was then used for nuclear testing. They had expected to need to drop it on August the 19th, but since they didn't need to drop it anymore because Japan had surrendered, they were able to do all sorts of nuclear tests to examine how the device would actually work. And so this is how a small lump of plutonium gallium alloy ended up being used in one of the first experiments to see what made a nuclear core go critical. If you're not all that familiar with how nuclear devices work, then do please check out my other video on the uh, Succeed in Your GCSE channel where I explain just how nuclear reactors actually work. A nuclear fission reaction is a cascade. One reacting atom releases neutrons, which then bombard other atoms and cause them to break down as well. And so on and so on. The process is self-sustaining, but only if you've got enough atoms. So you need a material which has been enriched enough, or you need a big enough mass of that material in order for the process to keep going. If you have a small enough mass that it won't start undergoing a nuclear chain reaction by itself, then it's known as subcritical. And this was exactly what was going on with the demon core, which at the time had the nickname of Rufus. Much less intimidating and much less threatening, but then they really didn't see it as a big threat. There were reports of people holding the thing in their hands and it would feel warm to the touch because there was a nuclear chain reaction going on, but it wasn't giving out so much radiation that there was any immediate danger. That said, I'm not sure I'd personally want to be wandering around holding a lump of active plutonium in my hands, but they didn't really see a problem back then. On August the 21st, 1945, two days after the core had originally been scheduled to be dropped on Japan, scientist Harry Daglian, working at Los Alamos, was investigating how you might make the core start to go critical. That is, how you might reach a point where there were enough neutrons breaking down enough atoms to make the whole thing start to become self-sustainable and, in essence, start to become a runaway reaction which could turn into a nuclear explosion. One way to make a subcritical core go supercritical is to surround it with some sort of reflector. It's constantly giving out neutrons which could be going on to break down other atoms if they were reflected back in. And so that's exactly what Harry Daglian did. He built a little wall of tungsten carbide bricks around the core in order to reflect those neutrons back into the core and cause it to get as close to being critical as possible. This was important research when it came to understanding how these nuclear cores worked and how they could be made to go critical and even supercritical. However, on the night of August the 21st, Harry Daglian had another idea and he went back to the lab, alone except for a security guard. And he was building a wall of these tungsten carbide bricks around the core. He got it to the point where it was almost critical where it was almost ready to basically become an uncontrolled nuclear reaction. And he was building these tungsten carbide bricks around it. And then, having got to the point where it was almost critical, he decided to stop, but unfortunately, his hand slipped. He dropped one of the bricks right onto the core. It instantly went critical. He grabbed the brick and moved it away as quickly as he possibly could, but there was a bright flash of blue light, and he was heavily irradiated. There was a security guard sat at a desk some distance away, and he was also irradiated, but not quite as much. As you get further away from any sort of device giving out any kind of radiation, it basically obeys what we call an inverse square law, which is if you double the distance away from it, then you quarter the amount of radiation you're exposed to. And so the security guard was exposed to some, but it was Daglian who was exposed to the most. 
The blue flash of light is typical in these sorts of cases, where the air is heavily irradiated and then the atoms in the air need to re-release the energy which they've just absorbed and do so by glowing blue. It's estimated that Daglian received a between 2 and 300 rad radiation exposure. And sadly, it was fatal for him. He died 25 days later. By his bedside had been his friend and colleague, Louis Slotin, for an awful lot of this process. And sadly, we're going to come back to Louis Slotin pretty soon. The security guard, Robert Hemmerly, uh, received a much lower dose. It was around eight rads. And he died around 33 years later of leukemia. It's unclear whether or not this was a consequence of his radiation exposure at the time but it seems likely that it at least had some effect. This was a tragic accident in a new science under wartime conditions. Safety procedures didn't really exist and the possibility of something like this happening hadn't really been foreseen. That said, at this point, things should have been put in place to make sure this kind of accident never happened again. And this is where our story gets interesting because people continued experimenting with this nuclear core. Lewis Slotin, seen here with Harry Daglian before the accident, had seen exactly what the consequences of this sort of radiation exposure were. But Slotin was not the sort of person who you really picture when you think of a nuclear physicist. Here he is working on another nuclear device, and you can see that rather than going for the white lab coat or the full hazmat suit, he's instead opted for an entirely unbuttoned shirt and a pair of shorts, as though he's going for a day at the beach. Don't get me wrong, Los Alamos is very warm, but this does seem like maybe he's not taking things quite as seriously as we would nowadays. Slotin became the resident expert at Los Alamos on a new experiment, one which was kind of similar to the one which had killed his friend. This was where they took two beryllium spheres and they placed them around the demon core to reflect those neutrons back into the core. And by varying the separation of these two spheres, they were able to control the amount of neutrons which were reflected back in and get the core as close to critical as possible. And this is where it gets just mind-bogglingly stupid because the way that they controlled the separation of these two cores was with a screwdriver. In this clip from the 1989 movie Fat Man and Little Boy, you can see a recreation of that process and you can see just how astonishingly crude it is. However, actually this isn't quite accurate. Here's a picture of the real setup and you will notice that there is not any kind of shield to protect any scientist doing this procedure from the radiation which was being emitted. So Slotin, a very smart guy and one of the top nuclear physicists of the time, was working on a core which was pretty much identical to the ones which had destroyed two cities in Japan the year before, and he was controlling the entire process with a screwdriver wedged in an opening and stood there wearing nothing safer than a shirt and a pair of blue jeans. As you might imagine, something was bound to go wrong, and eventually on May the 21st, 1946, it did. For reasons which aren't clear anymore, the screwdriver, which was wedging the two halves of the two spheres apart, ended up not wedging them apart anymore. And the two halves closed, sealing that sphere, reflecting a huge number of neutrons back in towards the core and causing it not just to go critical, but to go supercritical. There was another extremely bright flash of blue light and there was a vast wave of heat which passed over the faces of everyone in the room. Slotin managed to remove the top half of the beryllium reflector really quickly. It was probably only on there for around half a second. But in that half a second, he was exposed to around a thousand rads of radiation. This is a huge exposure. This is the sort of exposure which definitely, definitely kills you. And this was pretty tragic, but more tragic was the fact that he knew that he'd been exposed to this, but he didn't feel any immediate symptoms. Exposure to this sort of radiation will definitely kill you, but not instantly. One of the first things he did was make a sketch of where everyone had been stood in order to calculate how much radiation exposure they'd all received. He also made sure that he tried to take some readings of how radioactive things still were 
but unfortunately the radioactivity meter which they were using had been so heavily exposed he couldn't get a proper reading from it. The other people in the room experienced various degrees of radiation illness, but all of them survived the incident, though it may well be that their lives were significantly shortened by the exposure to that radiation. Unfortunately, there's no way to be sure whether or not the radiation was the cause of the illnesses which eventually killed them. Sloten, however, was not so lucky. Within a week, he died, and it was a pretty gruesome death. One of the doctors performing his autopsy described it as being like having sunburn, but three-dimensional sunburn. Not just on the surface of his skin, but completely throughout his body as the radiation had passed straight through him and had caused damage all the way through his body's tissues. It was a tragedy, but after the death of Harry Daglian, it was a foreseeable tragedy. And that's what makes this so interesting, that it was astonishingly reckless given the knowledge that these people already had. In fact, Enrico Fermi, who was working at the base as well, and who is the inventor of the nuclear reactor, Enrico Fermi said that if they continued doing experiments in this way, they'd all be dead within a year. Sadly, he was proved right. Subsequently, all tests were halted until new testing procedures could be devised, where the whole thing was controlled remotely from a significant distance, so that if there were any problems like this in future, people wouldn't be exposed to this level of radiation. It's amazing to think that this was acceptable behavior at the time though, that we could be controlling the process which could potentially set off a nuclear reaction, and the person controlling it was stood right next to it, wearing nothing more complex than what I'm wearing today, and controlling the whole process with a screwdriver. That said, Sloten and Daglian have made their contributions to society. Our understanding of science, and particular nuclear science, became much better as a result of their investigations and their findings. And tragic as though it may be, their deaths also taught medical science about the effects of radiation exposure. And so we've become much better at understanding what happens when the human body is exposed to large amounts of radiation, in part by what happened to them. The thing which fascinates me so much about this story is the sheer hubris of the people involved. If we can take any kind of moral from it, it's that being clever doesn't make you immortal, and being an expert on something doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to either common sense or your peers who are telling you something's a bad idea. Being smart, doesn't mean you can't be astonishingly dumb sometimes as well. I hope you found that story interesting. Please like and subscribe if you did. You can also check out the rest of this channel where I post all sorts of other things I'm interested in, or you can check out my other channel where I post GCSE science revision. Finally, you can follow me on Twitter at MrThorntonUK. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.